everybody. Welcome. Um, my name is Mike. I, I, I work for Parks Mall. I'm the, the Wildlife Division District Leader that covers the Trans Pecos District. So um, we're very happy we're here that you are here. We thank you so much for coming. Uh, you know, the past few years, the past decade, bears have been slowly making a comeback. It's, it's been, it, and, and we've been watching it. And you know, bear management's got really two parts to it. Really, all the wildlife management, but it's especially true of bear management. That's that's the wildlife side and the people management side. And uh, lucky for us, the, on, the, on the bear side of things, it's pretty predictable. If there's easy food to get, they're going to get it and you're going to have a conflict with people. On the people management side, it's, it's pretty predictable too. It's much more controllable, but uh, the challenging part about this is, is human nature, and, and I'm included in this, is until something happens to us, we're probably not going to make any changes. But this meeting today is a big part of, of as we, as we uh, journey through this process of learning to live with bears together um, and, and the Terlingua Ranch and Terlingua Ghost Town and the Cootie Butte area are kind of on the front edge of bears that are recolonizing in the process of recolonizing from Mexico. And so uh, y'all are on the front lines and uh, we're happy that you're here today. Uh, so we can share some information. We also want to hear from you, and, and feel free to ask questions. And we're we'll gonna keep it informal. Uh, just you know, find a place to interrupt the speaker if you need to, or after each presentation, we will uh, we'll have time for questions. Uh, a couple of house, housekeeping things: we do have a sign-in sheet in the back. We would like you to sign in, and if you if you do want a copy of the powerpoints, uh, sign in on the sheet. Put your uh, email address, and we'll send you a copy of all the materials today uh, later on. Uh, we do have some, some donuts uh, and drinks back there as well if, if you need. Uh, bathrooms are in the back. We do need to say, uh, because we have a couple of film crews here, that you know, this is going to be filmed. Do I need to say anything else for y'all other than that? Y'all just need to be aware of that. Uh, we'll, one of them is for a fin and purse. Uh, Production that they'll just maybe need some tips <coughs> from the other uh, working with BRI they're gonna, and, and the university. So we're also they're going to post the video of the whole proceeding. So if someone missed it, uh, we'll, have the, we'll have that posted eventually somewhere. So today you're going to hear from uh, several of our uh, our biologists. We're going to start off with Krista Dimery. She's our non-game biologist for the district, and she's going to talk about. Some of the history of this recolonization that's, that, that we're in the midst of. Uh, after that, we'll have uh, our state mammologist who actually did our PhDs on bears. Uh, Dana's going to talk to us about, uh, about some of bear biology and, and bear behavior. And then we'll have a couple of presentations from two of our local biologists, uh, Rachel Connolly and Austin Bohannon, uh, on things we can do to help live with bears. And lastly, we'll follow up a presentation from Matt Hewitt at BRI, who is uh, just starting out on a PhD project uh, with, with bears in the area. So he's got some college on bears and, and he's going to fill us in on that. Uh, and again, then, then we have our game boards here to, to you know, fill you in on anything from a legal perspective and uh, answer questions. And we'll have big, plenty of time for questions and answers at the end as, as well. Uh, at our first meeting this morning, we had a representative from the from Texas Disposal Company. We'll put his information up at the end. He couldn't stay for this meeting, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll put that information up there. So they have been working to get bear-proof dumpsters in the communities. You need to keep asking, and it, it's a process, uh, but please keep asking. I know there's DBs, DB at DB's Barbecue told us he got his last week or, or so. So uh, for those of you in this area with, with, with dumpsters, please, that, that's the message. Is Keep asking, and they are working on it, which is which is great because that's that's a big hurdle for this whole effort of becoming, you know, learning to live with bears. Is, is if those dumpsters can't be secured, it's it's going to be a hard battle to win. So, so they are working with us, and we'll get his contact information up on the screen there uh, at the end, so you can jot down his number. But with that, I'll turn it over to Krista to talk a little bit about the history of recolonization.
everybody. Um, like Mike said, thanks for coming. We've got a lot of great outreach material at the back. We've got free stickers and other stuff you can pick up. Um, please sign in and let us know if you want a copy of the PDF. Um, and my message for you today, starting us off, is a history background of bears living in Texas and to walk away from the day knowing that Texas is bear country. So if you don't mind picking up a sticker, <coughs> Promoting that knowledge with your fellow residents and anybody who comes to town that this is bear country and, and we're, we're happy to have bears back in Texas. But to start us off, I thought I would do a little time up here, so we're going to go back to the turn of the 20th century. Um, whether you knew it or not, black bear were actually mascots for many of the military uh, individuals that were stationed out here in West Texas. This is a group that was stationed outside of Marco, Texas, and as you can see, they're feeding a young cub there. Um, so a lot of the work done out here when those guys could get their hands on a bear it became the company mascot. Taking us all the way back to when Vernon Bailey actually did the biological surveys of Texas, he traveled the entire state documenting whatever he could about Texas at that point in time. And when he made it out here to West Texas, he noted that black bear were extremely common throughout all of the Upper Chisos Basin. There was abundant sign, uh, both new and old, of, of black bear being active in the area. He made his way up to the Davis Mountains and reported the same thing. He said black bear were holding their own against unusual odds. Continued north up into the Guadalupe, same story. Black bear are extremely common all throughout West Texas during this point of time. But what exactly did Vernon Bailey mean in the Davis Mountains when he said black bear were holding their own against unusual odds? And what he was referring to was that apparently black bear tastes good. Uh, in my research of the history of black bear in the state, I have found newspaper articles from Dallas, Austin, and Houston, as far as Houston, guys, um, throughout the late 1800s talking about hand-fall black bear for sale. Or maybe what you really want for Christmas dinner is a Christmas black bear roast. Um, so they were on the menu in the late 1800s. In 1890s, there was the famous Davis Mountain bear hunt that was held every year in November. Ranching families from all over would come and gather for a week-long period um, during November. Um, they said it was not uncommon for them to kill 10 bears, 15, a mountain lion or two, and at that point, even a wolf. So we've changed a lot since then. That was a common activity. 10 years later, 1901, Vernon Bay still documents that they're common in the Davis Mountains. But by 1944, when Big Bend National <coughs> Park was founded, there are reports of essentially no resident bears present in the area. And by the 1950s, Texas considered them to be extinct. <coughs> this is an image that I thought symbolized that pretty well. This is a bear that was taken near Marfa, Texas. If you're better with vehicles than I am, you could probably put an exact date on that image. But as you can see, um, this kind of symbolizes the end of the black bear era in West Texas. From the 1940s until the 1980s, we were receiving scattered reports of bears wandering across from Mexico. Um, in the 1980s, Big Bend National Park started to receive more and more visitors reporting black bear sightings, and Mexico actually led the way in a protection effort for black bear when they closed all hunting seasons in 1985. Now Texas followed suit two years later where we declared black bears to be endangered in the state in 1987, and then um, in 1988, which is a pretty landmark observation, a visitor actually documented the first female with cubs in the national park which essentially signals that we may have a breed population back in the state. It's a huge landmark for a species that was extirpated. In 1996, Texas uh, Parks and Wildlife determined that there were enough bear in this part
part of the state that we downlist the dome from endangered to threat. In the early 2000s, we actually set up an online database where we keep track of all the observations that are reported to Texas Parks and Wildlife. And over a 21 year period, 2000 to 2021, we had a statewide total of almost 500 sightings reported to Texas Parks and Wildlife, with 269 of those coming from District 1 and from the Trans Pecos. This does not include the past year sightings, and I can tell you that that number would be much higher if I included this past year sightings. Looking at the trend of that data over time, you can tell that in the past 21 years, uh, we had some high activity in the early 2000s. Activity seemed to drop, and around this period of time, we had a really bad drought, 2004, and it was actually reported that all the you know, black bear left the national park and went back into Mexico. They've since returned after that drought succeeded. Um, but as you can tell, we've started to see a big uptick here recently. The map there on the right, um, 2020 to 20, 2022, you can see that Brewster's that vibrant purple color showing that we've had an extreme number of reports from Brewster County as well as Carroll County. And bringing us up to this past year, I wanted to touch base on the Terling Ghost Town Bear and the events that surrounded that individual. I received the first reports of this individual on November 6th. He was raiding dumpsters at BB's Rustic Garden Barbecue. And I like to say you can blame him because BB's got a great barbecue. Um, me and the staff were down here the very next day, uh, walking town, handing out pamphlets on how to be very wise, what we can do to mitigate attractions in town. And then um, on November 8th, we actually conducted our first aversive conditioning or hazing of that individual. We shot him with paintballs, and then we chased him in the direction away from town. And we did that until nightfall, and then we felt pretty secure. He's not coming back, we did our job. Well, the very next day, I had a report that he was back in the dumpsters and turned over ghost town. So we back down here into Lingua. Um, second immersive conditioning effort, we stepped it up. We actually deployed rubber buckshot on top of the paintball guns just to reach out, touch him a little harder this time. Um, he responded extremely well, very fearful of people. Um, we used the air horn and we got him out of town. And we thought, yeah, we finally taught this bear a lesson. And guess what? He stayed in town the rest of the week. It was on November 14th after his name multiple times that we finally conducted our last adversive conditioning around. Here again, we shot him with paintballs multiple times, hit him with buckshot a couple of times, rubber buckshot, and he was back within 15 minutes. So this was a pretty big wake-up call to us. We didn't even have to wait till the next morning to find out he was back in the dumpsters. He was back within 15 minutes. And so because of that behavior that we had established over the past week, two weeks, uh, we met with leadership, discussed the Black Bear response plan, and discussed what our next actions could be. Uh, we decided that no amount of aversive conditioning was going to keep this bear away from dumpsters at this point in time. And so we decided that because our residents were taking steps they needed to to secure attractants, what we needed to do was give them more time. So the goal um, was to give the residents time they needed to secure those attractants. And so on November 16th, we deployed a trap in Trilingua Bose Town to catch that individual bear. And this decision was made because we were talking about one bear. It was an extremely high human use area. Um, he was nearly hit by a motorist here in town. And we knew he was not responding to aversive conditioning in a way that was going to make him stay away from that attraction. He was captured on the night of the 17th, and on the morning of the 18th, we um, guarded him, worked up that sedated individual, we took a whole bunch of samples, uh, measurements, we worked with BRI to actually put a collar on this individual and put tags in his ear, and then we relocated him to Black 
very few relocation sites we have in the state. I will note that even though this individual kept coming back to dumpsters, we did report that he was learning a fear of humans the more we hazed him. So he associated us and the green shirts with a really bad time, um, which is good. He established a fear of humans, um, but unfortunately that drive to come back to the uh, attractant is so strong in black bear, we needed to give our residents more time. And Dana's going to touch a little bit more on bear behavior and why that is, and then Matt's going to follow up on um, the relocation of Do you all have any questions? I guess. Really, you know, the disposal companies were trying it, but it was going to take them a while. And so thought process, my thought process in that decision was, A, we can leave the bear there because the more people have problems, that's going to motivate them to make some changes. Or B, because they're trying, but they're kind of stuck until the disposal companies can get up to speed. We can try and work with them, uh, you know, Basically, show them some goodwill that, yes, you're trying, we'll do what we can, but this isn't going to be a permanent solution. So that's the decision we made that was a, a part of the thought process behind it. We figured he would be back uh, in, in fairly short order. Uh, turns out, lucky for y'all, I'm lucky for the folks at Tulema Ranch. On his way back, he ran into the lodge and all those dumpsters there. And he had already learned that dumpsters were a good source of food. And he's uh, he got intercepted there and has been uh, causing them some kind of things. So yeah, hi everybody, I'm Dana, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about their natural black bear behavior and some things that you do if there's uh, you have any interactions with them. So first, just to go through a little bit of uh, a year in the life of a bear. So I'll start with summer. So summer is usually considered about May through the end of August, and this is typically their breeding season. Um, now, females will start breeding when they're about three to four years old. Usually, it can vary a little bit. That's usually about the time they start breeding. Cubs will stay with their mom for a year and a half. So at this point, those yearlings now are going to start to be leaving their mom in that, that second summer of theirs. Um, then we move into the fall, and this is hyperphagia. So this is from that September through the end of December is usually what we consider it. And hyperphagia means that they are in this um, physiological state where all they want to do is eat. They, um, their bodies know that they have to prepare for winter coming up and denning, and um, it doesn't necessarily matter what, what latitude they're at for that. They just need to eat, eat, eat. And they will go and eat up to about 20,000 calories per day. So you can imagine that with that bear that was here in the ghost town, that was November, he needed those 20,000 calories. Uh, a couple you know, bruises and stuff weren't going to stop him. His brain was hardwired just to eat. Um, and so then in the winter, so pregnant females, they will den, but out here and in a lot of the, the southern states, um, denning by males and females that aren't pregnant, it, it varies. It's um, some will, some won't. Others will still be moving around, but they'll maybe use a day bed here and there, you know, bed down for like a week and then get back up and move. Um, and some of that's just because with the mild climate here, there's more food still available and, and those sorts of things. Um, females that are pregnant will give birth around the beginning of February, and um, they usually stay in the den with their, their newborn cubs till about sometime in April, um, and then they'll get up and we'll start the year again. And so bears are omnivores. They eat um, all sorts of things, all sorts of plants mostly. They will eat uh, animal matter, but usually it's in the form of insects. Um, if they can get their paws on a deer or javelina, they would do that too. Um, or if they find some carrion, you know, roadkill somewhere, dead animals, they'll, they'll totally eat that as well. Um, but most of their diet is made up of all of these plants, and I'm sure there's plenty missing from this list out here. Um, but with the, the social and the yetha, they'll kind of go and they'll bend down those outer leaves. 
things from up to about two miles away. So, um, you know, that's another reason for securing attractants, even if you don't always have bears around. Um, now that you know that they're coming out this way, um, they'll smell that, you know, barbecue in the dumpster from a long ways away, and they know that they can get a lot more calories so much more quickly out of that than they can, you know, sitting around and eating acorns. So, um, you know, even if there's not one right, right in town, it's still important to keep those attractants secure. So, to talk just a little bit about natural black bear behavior, um, this video isn't exactly the best, but uh, I was on a trail at Big Bend National Park, and walking along the trail, came up to this bear. Um, I had already yelled, he looked up, knew I was there, but in the pace of, of natural behavior, you can see he's just doing what he's doing. He's not really paying attention to me, but he did know that I was there. Um, you know, he's not staring at me, he's relaxed. There are a lot of behaviors that people don't recognize are signs of stress in animals. So, um, jaw popping, stomping, blood charging, I mean, you probably would imagine that the blood charge is a sign of stress, but the jaw popping, I'll show you in a minute, um, sometimes people think it's cute, they think it's funny, they don't recognize that this is a sign that the animal is uncomfortable. Um, and they might do these defensive behaviors when, yeah, they just feel cornered or there is a food source nearby, so they're trying to kind of protect that, that resource. Um, and they might feel cornered in situations that you don't even recognize, you know, that, that that's what's happening. So it might look like there's, um, uh, you know, woods behind them or something, and they can just go back into that. But they might know there's something else back there, and, you know, you're blocking their way out. So um, it's always a good idea to kind of be aware of your surroundings. Now, with predatory behaviors, um, it's going to look a lot different. A bear that's trying to predate on you is going to be silent. They're going to be staring at you. They're going to be stalking and following you continuously. Um, you know, their head will be lowered and things like that. So um, I have a couple of videos to show you, to um, show some of these behaviors. So I had a video of a bear that wasn't in a trap doing some of these, but it wasn't loading. So we've got some from the, the bear in the trap, but it's the same idea. That, that jaw popping there. Um, I think the next video is a little bit better, maybe. Um, so this is one from a trap in Florida. Um, Um, and these were all adult male bears um, or some adult male bear 
Um, only a few were females with cubs. Um, usually a person alone out on the trail. Um, and a fair amount of those also had a few years of sort of garbage present. So it's, it is really rare, but it could happen. Um, so the things that you want to do when you're out and about, when you're out hiking, um, always be aware of your surroundings. You don't want to accidentally sneak up on an animal or any of those things, so you know, pay attention to what's around you. And typically you want to hike in groups and stay together, and especially if you have young kids, don't let them you know, wander off. Um, you want to keep them near you and within sight. Um, again, dogs are, are a tricky one, so you definitely want to make sure that they're leashed if you have them with you, but you know, better yet, just don't bring them on your hiking trip. Um, I mean, it's sad, I have dogs too, I like to go hiking with them, but um, when you're in bear country, it, it, it gets tricky, and, and there are rules in the National Park anyway, so um, there are things you have to consider aside from bears. And when you are walking, especially when you're in a more thicker habitat, um, make noise. Uh, a lot of people, you know, you may have seen it on TV or things, they walk around and just, hey bear, you know, and things like that, or there are bear whistles, and you know, just constant, Every little while, make some noise, make sure that if there is something in the area, they know you're there at some point. Um, and then, I didn't bring it up here, but we do have a bear, yeah, bear spray is, um, yeah, Chris has got it back there. Uh, bear spray is a really nice tool to have. Um, if you do happen to get into a bad situation, um, it comes in really handy, and it works for other animals, not just bears. Um, so it's like a pepper spray, but instead of the, the human one, this one makes a big cloud. So, um, and you want to use it while the bear is still relatively um, kind of far away. But uh, if you do get bear spray, it's a good idea to, to look online, make sure you understand how to use it. Um, we're not going over that today. And so with your dog, you want to make sure you keep them leashed. Um, don't let them go chase after a bear or, you know, go up to a bear. I mean, I think that's fairly obvious, but, you know, it, it happens. Um, and if you do encounter a bear while you're with your dog, just try to get your dog close to you and just back away and um, try to get away from the area. Um, one thing I didn't say yet, do not run. Don't turn your back on the bear. Just back away. Make yourself look big. Make sure the bear knows you're there. Um, you know, yell at it and, and back away, stay calm. But um, yeah, with your dog, of course, that, that's why it's a little bit trickier to have one with you. And so if you're camping, you want to make sure that you keep your campsite clean. Um, don't cook right next to your tent. You want to keep that separated. Don't bring any of your food back to your tent. Um, don't bring any other smelly things into your tent. Um, it's great if you have a bear box at the campsite or if you have they have little bear canisters, um, some different things. Uh, you want to make sure that that bear can't get to your food at your campsite. Um, there are a couple other methods that, that you can use to secure your stuff as well. Um, and, you know, again, you just really want to think about all the other smelly things. You know, if you have like raspberry, scented uh, lotion and you slather yourself in that before you go jump in your tent for the night, you know, that's that's also an attractant, so you want to be aware of all those other things that smell like that. And I don't know where my video is. Um, that's unfortunate. Uh, well, if you go... There's a great video online. Um, <laughs> Uh, man, I'm not, I forget where exactly he is, but um, he was out in, in the woods somewhere, and this, it looks like probably a young bear, is um, following him. He's backing up and, you know, telling the bear, you know, back off, and the bear keeps following him, and it goes on for about three minutes, and, uh, you know, the, the, finally, the bear keeps coming a little bit closer and a little bit closer, and finally he uses his bear spray, and it's great. It's just one little puff of, of spray, and the bear turns around and runs off. So um, he did a couple things that, you know, one, if you're being stalked by a bear, please probably don't record it. Um, I think mean, focus on getting away. Um, obviously, walking backwards, um, you know, it would be easy enough 
jump to trip and you're focused on trying to you know get the video while you're doing that that could be dangerous um you know if you need to uh if you have a, a second where you think it's safe to grab something to throw at the bear that's a great option too um but again you don't want to get on the ground so that that could be dangerous and you don't want to turn your back you don't want to run um so Going back a little bit on our TPWD's bear behavior category. So when we're getting these reports and assessing situations, we kind of look at it, um, we kind of put them into different categories just so that we all are on the same page about what's happening. Um, we do accept general reports and sightings, so that's great. We want to hear about it. We want to know that you guys saw bears, um, you know, where you were, and if, you can, if they have any identifying features, those sorts of things. Um, but then if they are at, you know, a dumpster, at the deer feeder, those sorts of things, that puts them in a different category. So now they're using um, human-provided foods, and we want to keep track of that. Um, we have a behavior three, which is the, the habituated bear. So they're repeatedly coming back to dumpsters, repeatedly coming back to deer feeders, those sorts of things. Now they know, they associate those sorts of structures with them, um, and potentially people with food. We have special one for bears in high human use areas and school zones. Um, obviously, if there's a bear right next to a school, that's something we need to do something about um, right away. It's a little bit different than a bear, you know, from, uh, uh, off on a ranch somewhere with the, the children or everything. Um, so then we have behavior five and six for bears that have killed or injured livestock or repeatedly killed or injured livestock. We haven't encountered those sorts of bears really in, in the state, um, and what we can do, that would be nice. Um, I think we've had like one case of a bear that killed some chickens. Um, you know, where those fall in line, it's a little bit different than, you know, killing a, a goat or something. So, um, and I think we've had one case where a bear came close to people in Black Gap. Um, but, but that's about it. It's really rare right now, and we want to keep it that way. So um, that's why we're here talking to all you so that we can make sure that doesn't change. Um, and so we have some different response ac actions, options that we can take. Um, so one, of course, we can you know, take the information, visit with you guys, um, give you some information on what things you should be aware of, what you can do. Um, and that's in the case where you know, there's nothing going on really. Um, if, it's a bear that's getting into dumpsters, then that's where you know we're kind of at that action too. We want to make sure that people start making some changes. They need to secure their, their trash, they need to secure whatever other attractions they have. Um, if they are making those changes and the bear is still coming back or there's some, some attractants that we can't control yet, um, we will try aversive conditioning that we talked about with the bear here. Um, so that's all those things like the, the rubber buckshot or paintballs. Um, you know, just yelling at the bear is a good idea too, and, and that's something that, that you all can do. Don't let the bear come up on your porch. And you know, it might look cute, but that's really not cute. And, and it might be fine right now in the moment, but when it goes to your neighbor's porch, they might not be expecting it. It could be a problem. So we don't want the bear to associate um, anything good with being near people. Um, so then we can move to action four, which is translocate to the closest designated location, which is you know, obviously what we ultimately did with the bear here. Um, and it's not something that we want to do. You know, it's, that's, that's, we're getting down to some, some difficult decisions. Um, obviously, taking a bear out of its home where it goes and moving it somewhere else is, is tough for the bear, or potentially tough for the bear. I mean, I know I wouldn't want to just be picked up and moved wherever. Um, but also, if attractants aren't secured, as I think we've already talked about, you know, the bear could likely come right back. So, you know, we went through all of that time and effort, stress on the animal, um, manpower, you know, just for the bear to, to have to take a little bit of a longer walk to come back. Or another bear might move in. So we really need the emphasis to be on the community to, to secure all those things um, before we get to that. In this case, it was a little bit special because we knew that you all were trying. We knew it was going to take time to get those dumpsters out here. Um, and we were in that, that hyperphagia time. That bear was not going to leave. Um, and we also had an option.
option to move it to Black Gap. Uh, we only have certain places that we can release bears. Um, and you know, some considerations go into that of if the, the case makes sense. So in this case, that bear you know, is coming from an environment similar to Black Gap. So it, it made sense that bear we knew was going to be fine out there. Whereas if we had um, some sort of similar issue up in um, out in East Texas, we wouldn't want to take it bear from there and move it to Black Gap. You can imagine that that would be really difficult for that bear. Um, we do have uh, the option to euthanize or transfer to a zoo if a facility has space. Um, you know, obviously, especially in, in Texas, with them being a threatened species, um, and on this recolonizing front, we really, really, really don't want to do that. And that would be a major decision that would involve a lot of uh, people up in leadership and everything before that happens. Um, but if, you know, in certain conditions, it, it might be necessary. So with that, I will hand it over to the top oh, oh, yeah, does anybody have questions before? Nobody really did anything about it. I'll just come back tomorrow and try the same thing. 
So as the bear is used to receiving repeated food rewards from a human-dominated environment with no negative consequences, the bear climbs this ladder of progression and ends up becoming more bold in its search for food in these human-dominated landscapes. So the bear is willing to do more risky behaviors to acquire that food, even when there are humans around. And ultimately, this uh, ends up being a human food condition bear. So we know that this bear is going to look for, for human habitats because it knows that where there are people, there's good food, and it's usually free. And this is always bad for bears, and it's always bad for people that have to live around these bears, right? These bears will start doing risky behaviors like trying to enter buildings and trying to enter homes, uh, which ultimately leads to TPWD having to make some kind of decision on what's going to happen to that bear. And in a lot of cases, a fed bear can become a dead bear. When wildlife is repeatedly fed, and especially wildlife that's large, like black bears, uh, they can become very bold and very brave in the decisions that they make around humans. And in a lot of places, it's actually illegal to feed wildlife. Uh, here, all we can really do is advise you to be very knowledgeable about the wildlife that you're trying to feed, when you're trying to feed them, and how you're trying to feed them, so that we can restrict black bear access to any of those really great high calorie food sources whenever we can. So I'm going to go ahead and give you guys six easy habit changes that you can make at home to prevent human bear conflicts. These are going to be things that you can do to minimize the chances of attracting a bear to your house. Um, we're going to go through each of these things one by one, but the first thing you're going to want to do is try to secure your garbage, secure your wildlife feed, secure your pet and livestock feed, Make sure you keep outdoor cleaning and or outdoor cooking areas clean. And you're going to want to secure your small livestock. And finally, you're going to want to report your bear sightings to the appropriate authorities. All right, so the first thing that you can do is to keep your garbage secure. So the main thing that we recommend you doing is keeping your garbage in an inaccessible area until the day of pickup. If you can, you can put your garbage in a shed, in the garage, in a closed barn. If you can't do something like that, you can actually buy uh, bear, bear proof garbage um, carts. So not like a huge bear proof dumpster, but a secured cart where it's harder for a bear to open that or break into it. But we do suggest never putting your garbage out the night before pickup. Always wait until you know the truck's going to come pick up this day and you're going to have a shorter period of time where the bear has an opportunity to get into your garbage. Also, you can use a bear proof garbage uh, dumpster, which that's going to be dependent on, upon your garbage service provider. So there are several styles of those available, but there are a couple important features of a bear proof dumpster. The first is that they always have a metal body. So you can see on this one here that this bear is trying to get into this metal dumpster, which also has a metal lid. And in some cases, you can have just a reinforced plastic lid. And it also has some secure clips, latches, or lock bars. But it's also important to note that if you don't use your secure clips or, or lock bars, the bear proof trash can is, is no longer bear proof. So it really takes a little bit more effort and it takes community effort on everybody's part to ensure that the bear proof dumpsters are used appropriately. You're going to have to ask your service provider to bring bear proof dumpsters to your community. So it's always a great idea to reach out to them, whoever you can get in touch with with your uh, garbage company, and try to kind of push them and get the community rally together and try to push them to bring some bear proof dumpsters. If you're unable to get a bear proof dumpster, you can make some modifications to uh, your existing dumpsters. You, again, should probably contact your trash service provider and ensure that they will continue to service that dumpster whenever you do something to it. But uh, you can scan this QR code here, and this will give you a couple of ideas on things that you can do to your existing dumpsters to make them safer for bears. Uh, things like using a plywood lid with chains to prevent bears from falling through the top of a plastic lidded dumpster. You can put metal reinforcement under the lid of plastic lidded dumpsters, or you can <coughs> modify the lock bar so that it holds the plastic lid down. So the second important thing that you can do is secure wildlife feed. A lot of people uh, you know, like to feed wildlife near their home, whether that's bird feeders or small tripod feeders. 
but it's important to realize that bears can't tell the difference between food that's been set out for deer, or raccoons, or foxes, or birds, and food that you've set out for bears. They just realize that that smells really great and they're going to come participate in the wildlife feeding activity that you set up for them. Uh, so, one important thing you can do is take down bird feeders when bears are active, especially at night. That's, that's including uh, hummingbird feeders. A lot of people don't realize that a single, you know, average size bird feeder full of black oil sunflower seeds can provide all of a bear's caloric needs in a day of hyperphagia. They, they're really great sources of calories. So here's a little bit of evidence of black bears being very attracted to wildlife feeders. You can see these three guys here just hanging out, having a picnic, with a whole lot of protein feed on the ground. And as we know, or as we heard from Dana earlier, bears can smell these things from up to two miles away. So they're going to be drawn to these types of resources. So if you're planning on setting up a protein feeder or something like that for deer, um, you want to make sure that this is in a remote place where you're able and willing to allow bears to come, or you need to secure it in some way, and Austin will talk about ways to do that later. So here again are some bears hanging out, enjoying some bird seed. Uh, as you can see, this guy has almost finished bird, the bird feeder full of sunflower seeds, and one had to grab some suet cake, and he's gonna hang out and eat that too. And it may seem cute as, at first. If you see you know, a young bear hanging out and eating your bird seed, you may think that's just harmless. But that bear has now learned that he can come back to your house where there's people and get a free meal. So the next time that he is hungry, he'll come back seeking the same type of opportunity. And they show up at your house or your neighbor's house. Uh, and that's just starting, you know, that first run on the ladder. So we want to stop them as early as we can so their behavior doesn't progress. One way that you can protect your bird feeders or other areas that are not easy to lock, lock or latch is by using unwelcome mats. So unwelcome mats have very broad applications. You can set them under things like this one is right here. Or you can create them in different shapes to put them in front of doors or windows or other areas where bears may try to get in. Basically, it's a surface that's spiked with nails. Um, this one is a horse stall mat, and we basically just we used the nail gun and we shot nails into the bottom of it and we flipped it upside down and we made a very painful doormat. So whenever bears try to walk on this, not only is it uncomfortable, but it also makes it very difficult for them to stand stably on the surface. So they don't have the ability to use their, their forearms to force or to grab most things. And as you can see in this picture right here, the bear would have to be standing on that unwelcome mat to be able to reach that bucket of bird seat. So you can be creative in the way that you use it, but you have to kind of think like a bear and illustrate where they would stand and how they would need to act in order to reach that attractive. Here's a picture of an unwelcome mat that's made out of plywood. Uh, and this one's being used to prevent the bear from accessing this, this structure right here. So the third thing that you can do when you're trying to prevent bears from, you know, creating bears from being around your home is to secure pet and livestock feed. It's advisable to keep your feed in a secure container and also in an area inaccessible to bears. So it's probably not a great idea to have just a whole stack of horse feed, for example, in your barn. If you're able to store that in a more secure area, uh, that would be a lot better. Um, there's plenty of other containers that can be used. For example, we assisted a local landowner out here in moving their stash of feed to a horse trailer where a bear is not able to access it. So you can think outside the box and be a little more creative about that. Uh, you don't always have to, you know, to build a brand new barn or something with lock and key to keep the bear out of it. Also, you want to make sure not to leave used food bowls or uneaten feed outside of your home. Essentially, if you are gonna feed your pet, like on your back patio, for example, even though your dog may have eaten all that food in about 10 seconds, the smell is still there. So bears can still smell that. They're still gonna come to your house looking for that free food, especially if you've left out a dirty dog bowl. So our best advice is to feed your animals indoors if possible. If you can't do that, please don't leave food out on your patio or dirty bowls on your patio. Just feed the exact amount that the animal's gonna eat 
and pick up the bowl after they're done and clean it. Bears are perfectly capable of taking your entire stash of livestock feed. So you can see in this picture here on the left that he's taken at least two or three bags of 50 pound feed out to a pasture and attempted to bury it so he can snack on it later. Um, and here you can see on the right a bear that has like this, it looks like he's taken out some dog food. So they, they really are capable of carrying those things and that is a lot of calories and that's very smelly food so that's high attractive for them. If we're able to prevent them from accessing them in the first place, that really work out in their favor and in ours. All right, so next you want to make sure that if you're using an outdoor kitchen or a grill or cooking outdoors, that you keep those areas clean. Uh, we suggest that as soon as you're done cooking, go ahead and clean that area up. Don't, you know, be hanging out the barbecue pit, and give yourself some steaks, and then go inside for the rest of the night, and maybe come back out and clean it around noon tomorrow. You want to go ahead and do your best to get that area as clean as possible as soon as you're done cooking. Uh, that includes making sure that you don't dispose of wastes such as meat scraps or cooking oil near your home or outdoors. Uh, you also want to make sure to not clean and store pots or pans or cooking utensils outside. Go ahead and pick those things up and store them inside if possible. And if you have a garage or a shed or somewhere where you can take your uh, grill and go ahead and store it in there, that would be the best place for that. One of the last things that you can do is make sure that you secure your small animals. As Dana mentioned earlier, there's not a lot of incidences of black bears uh, predating upon livestock in Texas. Um, however, animals such as sheep, goats, and chickens can easily become easy prey. So we recommend uh, setting up, for example, a chicken run with a coop, making sure your coop is locked up every night, moving your goats and sheep maybe into a small pen with a barn and ensuring that they're locked up safely at night. And if there are persistent bears in your area, you can consider using an electric fence to keep bears out of your livestock areas. And Austin will talk to us in a little bit about setting up an electric fence. Finally, uh, the best, one of the last things that you can do, and one of the best things you can do when you see bears is to let folks know. There's three main parties that would really like to be aware of bears in your area. The first is uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife, Biologists, and Game Wardens. As we talked about earlier, we use these bear reports to under, better understand where bear populations and breeding populations are within the state, so that we can better understand how these animals are recolonizing. Um, and we also use this to inform our decisions on what we may need to do with that bear. For example, the bear here in Terlingua, if we did not receive any uh, not notifications about, hey, the bear's in this trash can, or oh my gosh, the bear is over here, and he may have almost got hit by a car, we would not have been prepared or educated enough to, to make appropriate decisions about that animal. <coughs> Next, you want to contact your local law enforcement and just let them know that there's a bear you know, near your house or in your neighborhood, and this is just from the standpoint of human safety, so that if uh, there is you know, a safety concern that local law enforcement Finally, you want to let your neighbors know about the bear's presence. And that's also to hopefully convince your neighbors to take some steps to prevent bears from, from coming closer to their home and to sort of be more bear-wise. And it's important to work together to create this sort of bear-wise community. You communicate with your neighbors, try to encourage them to do some of these six things and to prevent bears from becoming attracted to your home. So, uh, there's two QR codes up here. One of them is to find your local biologist, and the other one is to find your game warden. Uh, if you scan these and you go on our website, there's a cell phone number listed for each of us. So whether it's 2 a.m. or 2 p.m., if there's a bear at your house, we would definitely like to know. Um, and Krista will be receiving all of our bear reports, so she'll put them in that fancy map that she showed us earlier. That's all I have for y'all.
started this project this past October, I think October 3rd or something was like. First capture was October 1st. First capture. So we're going to turn it over to Matt and the BRI team and let them give you all an update on the current efforts as well. Thank you. All right, yeah. hi everyone. Thanks for coming today and talk to you all a little bit um, about the research that we're doing. Um, so yeah, I'm Matt Hewitt. I'm a PhD student, or soon to be PhD student on this project. Um, here at the Borderlands Research Institute, we're out of Sol Ross State University up in Alpine, Texas. Um, with me here today is, is Nicole Dickin. Um, wave her hand back there. She's going to be the master's student on this project, and uh, Dr. Amanda Dutt. Um, she's the, the postdoc on the project, um, the one that's keeping us moving forward and keeping us all online. So, uh, yeah, like Kristen mentioned a little bit ago, um, you know, Harris was actually from Texas about the mid-1900s um, and started coming back uh, you know, in the 1980s, mid-1980s, which was a report of black bears in the National Park. Um, and, you know, we assume at least coming back from the mountains of Mexico. It's, it's a pretty strong assumption that, that that's where they're coming from. They're moving northward. Um, and, you know, within the past, Five years, and I guess you guys know better than anybody else. In the past, you know, one or two years, it really kind of branched out. You know, outside of the park, coming into the local communities and, and starting to engage with people, um, and that really presents a, a, an area of study that I think is very important. Um, so, with that, Borderlands Research Institute started a very long-term research project. Um, it's going to be, you know, five plus years um, of data collecting and and, uh, and, and research. Uh, with some pretty broad overarching goals. You know, there's, there's things that we want to um, you know, accomplish in, in the long term. Uh, one of which being local, or understanding local population ecology. Uh, so things like birth rates, you know, survivability, um, you know, diets, broad scale habitat preferences, things like that. Uh, aid in understanding drivers of human bear conflicts. So, you know, we, borderlands won't be the ones doing on ground, you know, management or uh, or mitigation, but we can we can help supply text parks and wildlife with the best information uh, available at the time. So you know, if you study this specific population, you know, try and uh, you know inform text parks and wildlife the best we can. Um, and also help inform management efforts. So even outside of, of human bear you know conflict situations, um, you know, try and get the best information you can to make the best management decisions in the long term. Um, and right now, so for the short term things that we are doing. You know, now projects that, that have started and, and answers that we are trying to get at. Um, Nicole is going to be starting her, her master's position here pretty soon, looking at seasonal movements and uh, behavior of black bears. So how movements and behavior might change on a seasonal basis, you know, from summer into fall into winter, back into spring, um, as well as some fine scale habitat selection. So you know, kind of, kind of on, a, on an individual bear basis, right? Like, does it does it choose to go to, to this restaurant or this restaurant? This food source for this food source, right? Or, or this water source for this water source. Um, so kind of on you know a, a finer scale, smaller scale habitat selection, um, and then broadening up um, some some of these questions that I would hopefully take in my PhD. Um, some broader uh, habitat modeling and population level um, modeling. Um, you know, some bears are, are coming back into Texas. They're moving northward, right? Um, at least that's the idea. Um, so potentially modeling. What that movement would look like moving northward, what habitats they used to move northward, and what some of those corridors might look like. Um, so to do that, we are capturing and collaring bears, you know, right here in, in the Trans Pecos and, and South Brewster County, um, as well as some other places, but kind of you know, at the moment focusing right here locally. Um, we are using culvert traps to catch bears. So there's you know one out front if you feel like going around and taking a look at it. Um, it is a very safe and reliable uh, method for capturing bears. Um, it is used you know, all over the world for capturing you know, every species of bears that there is. Um, you know, the humans can't get hurt. You know, if the bear's in the trap, and other bears can't hurt that bear. The bear can't hurt you know people on the outside, right? So it's a, a very safe way of catching and containing. Um, and we also use um, so this is a satellite trap transmitter. It's a uh, you know satellite. Uh, Transmitter that whenever this little plunger pops out, it sends us a an email and a text message to you know a variety of people alerting us that that trap just went off. Um, a very useful tool, especially 
out here in you know in Western Texas where it does get incredibly hot, you don't want to leave a bear trapped in a you know metal oven for six hours in a day, right? So we are trying to reduce our response time as much as we can um, and get to that bear, you know, so it is safe. Um, so once we get to the bear, we are able to chemically immobilize it um, and pull it out of the trap and get it down on the ground, and, um, and we're taking every precaution we can to make sure this bear is, is safe and stress-free. You know, obviously it is it's under anesthesia, so it's not you know, awake by any means, but um, you know, to try to reduce the, the amount of stress that this bear goes under you know, during the time that we have it in hand. Uh, we also have uh, you know, some electronics hooked up to it to monitor you know, heart rate, breath rate, you know, oxygen saturation of the blood, so you know, all these vital signs to you know, ensure us that this bear is doing just fine. Um, and while we have the bear in hand, you know, we, we want this to be the only time that we ever have to handle this bear. You know, as researchers, we are trying to maintain this, this population as wild as they can possibly be. Um, so you know, we're, we're trying not to alter um, their natural behavior, right? So we don't, we don't want to have to mess with them more than we have to. So we try to get every sample we can while we have them in hand. So we're, we're collecting things like hair, uh, blood, tissue, fecal samples, um, you know, to do multiple analysis with uh, later on in the future, as well as attaching a tracking collar to them. Which I can pass around and you guys can look at it. Maybe this bag is very expensive. <laughs> Feel free to, uh, to look at it. This isn't the exact model we're putting on the bears, but it is you know, very, very simple. Um, and so once we have all this stuff uh, on the bear, we also do put ear tags. Um, so if you ever see a ear tagged bear, um, ear tags are small, that representative would love to know. Uh, we are also putting ear tags in them, uh, as well as a pit tag, the same sort of thing that your doctor can have to get to the vet's office. Um, and then, yeah, once, once we're done handling the bear, we do administer a reversal agent, which will bring the bear um, you know, out from under anesthesia. Um, usually takes about 10 to 20 minutes to come out from under anesthesia, and then it stands up and, and walks off of its own board and goes about its, about its business. Um, so a little bit about these collars. Um, they're made by a company called Vectronic. Uh, they are kind of the gold standard for collecting movement data on wild animals. Um, you know, this company makes collars you know, near to the ground go on elephants and as small as you know, go on little tiny baby, baby deer, right? Um, so you know, very experienced company and, and you know, like I said, kind of the gold standard for collecting uh, location data for animals. A um, little bit about our collars specifically, these ones are satellite capable, uh, meaning that they will uh, take a GPS point and upload it to a web service that we can then see um, and, you know, in almost real time, see where this bear is and, and what habitat it's using. Uh, they also emit a, a DHF signal, which is a very high frequency type of radio signal, um, but we can uh, try to be in actual real time, um, you know, if we're out on the ground uh, trying to find the bear level. We have them programmed to take a, a, a GPS location every two hours. Um, so taking 12 points a day, and it'll upload that web service twice a day. So you know, like I said, not entirely real time, but almost real time with the, with the GPS. Um, and these, these are, as I call it, as you fall off. This is not a permanent fixture on the animal. You know, it's not going to die with this collar. It will fall off. Um, and we try to fit the collar to the bear, right? You know, bears can range from, from yay big to, to yay big. You know, very small too, but very large bear. So it's not necessarily one size fit all. You know, so we have uh, different band sizes as well as different uh, battery sizes. And the battery size is what controls uh, that drop off mechanism. Um, so you know, we try and, and match the smaller battery size with the smaller bear. The smaller bears are the ones that are capable of putting on a lot of weight very quickly, growing very quickly. Um, so we don't want to fix you know something a certain size that fits them when they're three. You know, that might not fit them when they're six. So we. Put a, a collar that will drop off sooner on smaller bears and, and uh, collars that will last longer on, on larger bears. Um, so here's some, just some pictures. The top right is, is uh, us researchers using that, that uh, DHF receiver um, to you know, listen for the signal that this collar gives off. Um, and then this bottom picture here is, is what that GPS data looks like um, on the web surface. So some perspective here is you know, Big Bend National Park. Um, we are probably that white dot or something here um, in study view. That's the, the range of black gap is outline. Um, so capable of very, very big movements. Um, so yeah, uh, 
like Kristen said, this project started um, you know, this past summer, so we've only got about four months worth of data uh, on, on 10 bears, nine male, one female. Um, so you know, we, we're, we're still collecting data um, and don't have a, a whole lot to go off at the moment, but what we can tell you is that they're capable of very, very good movements. Um, certainly more than I ever thought you know, they, they would be moving out here. Um, so you have some examples here, 128 miles in 30 days, and, and that's not walking you know, in a circle. That's a straight line distance. Um, so capable of moving very quickly, very far. Um, and this BBM08, the one that got moved from the, the ghost town over here, you know, like Chris said, we moved him over to Black Gap Wildlife Management Area, and he was able to walk 35 miles back to the um, to the ranch headquarters in just under a week. And uh, showing, you know, reiterating that they are very, very few motivated. He's willing to do that to get back to his favorite food source. Um, another just kind of fun visual here. Um, there's a bear that we got out in Black Gap that wandered onto some, some private properties elsewhere and found themselves in deer feeders and has been there for two months. These points represent two months worth of time. He hasn't left. So he found something he likes and he's going to stay to it. Um, so here I'm going to kind of uh, roll through some you know, uh, home ranges uh, of the bears we have followed so far. So this little collection of points down here is every single uh, point of GPS location that a caller has sent from us or to us of this particular bear so that represents one bear. Um, and you know it's kind of hard to see and it's, it's really busy so I'm just going to throw a polygon around the outside of it um, and then roll through some multiple bears here. Um, so this one did venture down into the National Park into the Chisos Basin and um, up into the ranch area. Um, so yeah like I was saying capable of moving, moving very very far. Um, yeah, very dramatic movements. This one uh, made us uh, international bear researchers. Very proud of them. Made a little trip across the border and then came back. And then some, yeah, find a hillside they like and, and never leave. <laughs> They're very different. And then, yeah, this is our one female, which oddly enough has made the biggest movement. Next steps for the projects, we do have another 20 callers in the mail that we're going to be getting in um, and be continuing our coloring efforts into the spring and summer. Um, as well as continuing to help design and, and conduct studies that will help inform bear management in the future. Um, so like I said, this is going to be a longer term project, you know, five plus years. Um, it's going to be, you know, Nicole and myself and probably other students in the future. So coming up with, with more questions that, that will help inform text parks and wildlife to, you know, uh, manage the species. Um, and possibly leaning towards some, um, you know, some different techniques. Uh, colors are very expensive, like I mentioned. Uh, there are other methods out there for monitoring uh, populations, such as uh, hair snares or um, or uh, trail cameras. You know, some, some different methods that we might test out in the future. Uh, so yeah, thank you to Tech Parks Wildlife for putting this thing on, and, and uh, you know, thank you for hosting us here. I'd love to take questions. Yeah, I'm curious if you can track any of this the data mountains or uh, I know they're uh, we've heard, I've seen them uh, a few years ago, but yeah. Yeah, lately I haven't really heard anything about them. Yeah, so we have heard the and the Insects Parks and Wildlife has been talking, you know, there are some bears. Yeah. Uh, there are bears in the data mountains, you know, not as many as you might possibly think. But yeah, it is our intention to try and call some up there. We don't have any up there right now. We just have the tank kind of down here in Southern Virginia County, but um, yeah, probably this spring or summer we're going to attempt to get a couple dollars of the mountain. I don't think that new going into October that he'd be able to deploy 10 callers as fast as he did. It was like two months ago. So he is way more successful than he even thought he would be. <laughs> so he ran out of callers, he's got the new ones ordered. Once he has those in hand, we'll be looking to help him expand his research endeavors. I'm just curious, do you have an explanation for nine males and one female? Are the males more gullible and easier? <laughs> they might very well be. Um, no, so maybe we've got a little bit of a theory on that. You know, so this this leading edge of this population recolonizing into this area, um, you know, going back to kind of the bear ecology, right? The, the males are the ones that are going to take those exploratory movements, and the females are going to be the ones that kind of stick closer to where they were born and where they were raised. Um, there's actually a lot of 
of data to support that females will, will establish a, a home range right next to their mother's home range, or actually more, more likely to do that at least, yeah. versus the, the sons, the males, are the ones that are going to venture away out. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, being on this on this leading front, it, it does kind of make sense that we're catching the males, you know, the ones that are expanding out into new territories. And females have maybe more weary to approach a set of Everybody has a new process and we'll let the network out. Uh, 
right now as it is. But, so, any questions on the legal side of the black bears or? Yes, sir. This isn't a question, but it's probably something we can fix. Okay. Driving out of Alpine toward here, uh, in the vicinity of Elephant Mountain, is a sign. And it says something like, stop poaching and call the game word to drive. Would you please put a phone number on that sign? That's not one of them. The game word is not in the phone book. <laughs> that sign's been removed. Oh, has it? Yes, sir. Both going and coming. I'd like to know where it was. We, we kind of wanted them, but uh, they're not there anymore. Did somebody steal it? I, I don't know. Text on may have just removed it. Okay, it's, it's not that bad thing because game warden is not in the phone book. Yeah. It's not a complete sentence either. We probably <laughs> 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 uh, call, call the sheriff's department if, if you see something and they'll get in touch with us. Or, like they said, put your card in the back where you can scan it and have, have any local game wardens done for your fingers. I'm really pushing these cards, okay? You need to walk out with the card. <laughs> one side has it for the models, and one side of that has it for us. So, mm -hmm. We really want those calls and that information. And then also, you got, we have so many visitors around, so if you see somebody that shoots at a bear or happens to kill a bear, call us. We want to know about that information. Quicker, quicker you contact us, the quicker we can get somebody investigating it or get it resolved. Just like the group of high schoolers, peer pressure is going to be one of the most important things you can do. So if you see a group of tourists feeding a bear, or maybe we have another bear coming to Trilingua, and instead of yelling and trying to scare that bear, they're ooing and aahing and taking video. As a local resident, we really depend on you to kind of set the bar and standard for how we want to train our bears. Uh, so we would really appreciate you all's help on that front. And thank y'all for being here and your interest on our black bear shop here. So yeah, unfortunately, Unfortunately, Jay had to go. He uh, he joined us at the first meeting. But the message from Jay was a calling, and they are working on it. Uh, they have uh, replaced several countries as we've seen. But what I'll ask you all in in the in y'all's vicinity here, student youth, and some of those towns, what percentage do we have of dumpsters that have been replaced? Is it it's pretty small yet? We still have a ways to go. I think I'm going to do what now? I think only DBs. Only DBs. Yeah. 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 Yeah taken care of, then it's going to be a tough road, and so just you know, know that the message there, and, and Jay's at it, we can call it, and, and, and they are working on it, it's just going to, it's going to be a process, because this is this is new to them as well, so y'all's role is to stay on them, because uh, they're not going to respond to us, they're going to respond to their customers. Uh, so he did, he did ask us to share his info here, uh, so please take that if you're in that boat, where, and Republic, Services, which is the other disposal company working in the area, has has made a few changes too. They weren't able to send anyone, uh, but we have seen some of their customers get dumpsters replaced with the with ones that are bear fruits. So uh, definitely keep on it. Uh, you know, with that being said, yeah, I just want to thank y'all one more time, and uh, the, the answers are usually pretty simple. They're not always easy. So we're not unsympathetic to the to the effort you are going to have to make and to the, the investment, the costs, and you know, whether whether it's changing the way you do things, adding uh, you know, adding the expense of electrifying some things around your house. Uh, we understand that takes some effort. You've heard this is bear pressure, but it's people country too. And so uh, you know we're gonna have to just 
we're going to continue to work as a department to, to provide information, research these things, and when we're learning along with y'all. And although the, the principles are simple, uh, and keep, you know, keeping food away from bears, uh, you know, the, uh, the solutions are infinite. And what we presented here today are, are some things, uh, but, but there's uh, every situation is different, and, and you guys may be thinking of things as you encounter some situation around your, your property, and that's where we're learning along with y'all, trying, trying different things, and we're going we're gonna to hopefully uh, do a few more trials with our electric fencing stuff, uh, and and see if we can get away with the smallest energizer they have out there, which will bring the cost of it down about 50 bucks. And once we get uh, get enough answers on that, we'll put, probably start putting together some better publications on electric fencing uh, in, in this arid environment and how it can be used to secure some things. Uh, and we'll be pushing that out. And it's just going to be you know, it's going to be a process of of all of us learning, and it may be a generational thing. You know, it may take for decades. It's, to be colonized and, and people one by one learn to live with them. A uh, friend of mine, Bill, you remember you worked for Rich Beausoleil. He, he's, he's in Washington State now as a, as a bear and cougar specialist and he's like in, uh, dealing with uh, managing human bear conflicts to heart disease. And that everybody, the prevention is the key and everybody knows what to do to prevent it. <coughs> Oftentimes we as humans wait till it's too late to to want to do something about it. So we're kind of in a unique situation. It's we're on the front wave. We're I don't feel like we're too late yet, but uh, you know we as a department are committed to working with y'all uh, to try and make our our experience in uh, in living with bears and then transitioning into into that sort of a lifestyle um, be a good one. So but that thank you again can't thank you all enough. It's this man. Yes. Uh, I've composting. I mean, I've composted for 30 or 40 years, and I've never even thought about it being a problem. But now I'm seeing that that might draw better in. Uh, what can I do to continue composting Girl. and still have it safe? Uh, Correct. So the question is on composting, and uh, you know, what can she do to make her compost ball not be a problem for her? So you, you can you can put a, a small electric fence around it, you know. And I, I understand that's going to be an extra cost. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. Uh, and that's with our dry soils. You know, the electric fencing that is also described. You know, we, you've got to have. We can't use the earth and return ground return. It's just it's just too dry. The, the soil is too insulated, which makes it a problem for large scale fences like for livestock, but for small things like a deer feeder or a compost pile, you can do it. You can put a metal rounding apron uh, or, or a fence design like that hall panel with a, with a wire on top, kind of situated to try to get on the ball. And, and I, I is it a structure that has hall paneling over it? Could I electrify that whole area? Yes. Quite possibly. And, and this is where I was getting to earlier, like, there's, there's an infinite number of solutions, so best, my suggestion going forward, let's get your info and let's make a site visit with one of our biologists to look at what you've got there and see sure. see what we can learn together on a good way to secure that for you. Hey, Mike. Um, yes, Thomas. Uh, I'm, I'm Thomas Evans, by the way. I'm currently at the National Park and one of my there. We do a lot of composting things in the park, um, not in the Chisos Basin, because there's just so much very activity there, mm -hmm. but. Um, we, uh, a lot of people use um, compost that are in containers that are bear resistant, they're not completely bear proof. So in times of like really high bear activity, someone can move that indoors and move it to a secure location. So there are some, um, and I, I don't have like the things of them, but I can provide them to the Texas Parks and Wildlife, that like have a top that twists close, so the bear could maybe like, you know, roll it around, they wouldn't be able to get into it. There are some other um, ideas like, there, there are many eastern states that have large black bear populations where composting is uh, practiced a lot and they do have specific publications just for composting. There's also a chapter in Living with uh, Black Bear, Bad Bear on the Back that I recommend anybody who wants to learn more about things they can do to successfully and uh, cohesively live with black bear, you should 
library or buy a copy on your own and, and just look through there. I continually look through there even in my official job capacity just because it has a lot of really good information in that one book. There are also publications back there on electric fence and welcome mat. Feel free to reach out to any one of us and we can come down and make site visits like Mike said. So we're here to help y'all establish that example. Okay, um, y'all have the on-the-ground knowledge, y'all have the on-the-ground example. A lot of us are stationed in Alpine or further, so we're going to depend on, on y'all a lot to lead the community into becoming a, a fair, wise community. And that's the main goal. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm just wondering, do you, can you, will you give a presentation like this to kids at school so they can go home and teach their parents? Yes. <laughs> <coughs> I bought backpacks that are bare faces specifically for children, thinking that there might be more here. So I am prepared with that one. Thank you. Thank you.